Okay, welcome back to class, everybody. So last time in class, I wasn't able to record our lecture because I had some technical difficulties. And so I'm just going back and re-recording what we discussed in class. So the way that we began class was uh, with continuing our discussion from the previous time, uh, where we looked at several different ways that one might compute a stochastic gradient for a parabola. Uh, but there was one method, this method labeled two here, that we didn't actually know if it would produce a stochastic gradient. So the way this method worked is if we have a function f, what we're gonna do is project f on a uniformly random direction. So f is the gradient of our function and u is a uniformly random direction that we've picked. So uh, this is uh, the projection operation here. So f uh, grad f dot u uh, times the uh, direction u. And so the question is, whether the expectation of this uh, random vector is actually equal to the gradient. And what we're gonna show is that it's not quite equal to the gradient. It turns out that it's equal to the gradient times a constant that depends on the dimension of the problem, but uh, that is good enough for a stochastic gradient descent to work because this essentially corresponds to doing the algorithm with a different initial step size. So uh, let's go about doing that proof. Uh, here by beginning by just considering this problem in one dimension. So in one dimension, a uniformly random direction is either minus one with probability half or one with probability half. And so let's take a look at the expectation of uh, that uh, random vector. So with probability a half, it's gonna be minus one times minus one times grad f, which is gonna be grad f. And with probability half, it's gonna be one times one times grad f. So uh, that's this and that's equal to grad fx. So uh, at least in one dimension, when we look at the expectation of the random vector, we get exactly the gradient back. So let's see what happens in n dimensions. So in n dimensions, the gradient looks like a vector like this. So let's call each of the coordinates g1, g2, up to gn. And let's consider the expectation of uh, this projection. So uh, it's not gonna turn out to be exactly grad f, it's gonna be grad f times a constant. Uh, so let's see how one might prove that. So uh, to show that, we have to show that the expectation of this random vector is equal to this constant vector. And the way to do that is to consider each coordinate separately. So uh, on the left here, we have uh, the first coordinate of the random vector. So uh, let's think about how to write that. So this is a dot product of u and grad f. So that's I've written as this sum. And that's the first coordinate of u. So that's just u1. So this is the first coordinate of the random vector. And we're hoping that the expectation of this is gonna be g1, which is the first coordinate of grad f. So uh, let's just do some algebraic manipulation to this uh, to see if that's true. So uh, the first thing that we're gonna do is uh, we're just gonna distribute the u1. So here I've written it as a sum over all elements i that are not equal to one of ui times u1 times gi. And uh, here we have the sum of u1 squared times g1. So uh, let's consider this. And in particular, let's break it up into two pieces. So the first sum end and then the second sum end. So let's think about this first sum end. And uh, in specific, Let's just for a second think about things in two dimensions. So imagine conditioning on u1 and uh, picking a uniformly random direction in two dimensions. Then u2 has two values, one that's plus one and minus one. And so if we condition on u1, uh, intuitively we're hoping that the values of the other u is gonna cancel out this uh, expectation because they're gonna be symmetric kind of the same way that they are in two dimensions. And so hopefully this should be zero. So uh, let's see if we can formalize that intuition a little bit. So in n dimensions, uh, a uniformly random direction looks like a solution to an equation like this, u1 squared plus u2 squared plus un squared equals one, which uh, we can rewrite as u1 squared equals one minus the rest of these directions. Now uh, let's just take this first term and rewrite that expectation using the tower property of expectation. So here, we're conditioning on all of the u's other than u1. And here we have that sum. So conditioned on all of the u's other than u1, u1 has two values that it can take. One that's a positive uh, square root of this right-hand side and one that's a negative square root of this right-hand side. 
And both of these values are equally likely because uh, it's a uniformly random direction. And so when we condition on all the uh, other u's, u1 can either take a positive value or a negative value, and they're the same values, and they're one's positive and one's negative, so this expectation uh, is gonna be zero. So uh, this whole first sum and, uh, its expectation is zero. So for the second sum and, it's gonna be the expectation of u1 squared times g1, uh, which we're gonna rewrite just taking g1 uh, out of the expectation because g1 is a constant, and that's just the expectation of u1 squared, and it turns out that that is a constant that depends on the dimension. And just to give you some intuition uh, on why that is, let's just again think about uh, two dimensions. So in two dimensions, u1 squared is always a positive number, so it's always gonna be something between zero and one. So let's uh, think about it here. So it's always a number between zero and one, uh, and over here it's always gonna be a number between zero and one. So all of these points are gonna get mapped to a number between zero and one in terms of u1, uh, and so uh, it's gonna be uh, something like one half in two dimensions, uh, potentially something slightly different uh, because we're getting a bunch of bunching here uh, closer to one because uh, much more of the circle uh, in terms of uh, arc length is over here uh, closer to one uh, and uh, closer to minus one. And so uh, probably something slightly different than one, but it's a constant that just depends on the dimension. Uh, it depends on how that sphere looks like uh, in n dimensions. And so that's just a constant, and here we have g1. So the expectation of this stochastic gradient is not quite the gradient, it's just a constant times the gradient, and that's good enough for us to run our stochastic gradient descent algorithm. So that was the first topic we covered in class last time. Uh, and let's move on to the second topic, uh, which is considering uh, some important sci-fi functions that might help you with your uh, homework assignment. So in particular, there's one function which I used at least once in this homework assignment and many times in your next homework assignment that you might find useful. And that's uh, scipy.take. Uh, so you can look at the documentation here. So let's just read it quickly ourselves. Uh, so here we have an array A uh, and a bunch of indices. And uh, what we should do is from this array, uh, take uh, uh, the various corresponding indices. And this function uh, does the same thing as uh, fancy, uh, so this function does the same thing as fancy indexing. Indexing arrays, uh, however, it can be easier to use if you need elements along a given axis. And oftentimes, as opposed to reading the documentation, uh, what's useful for me is to take a look at some of the examples. So let's take a look at this first example. So here we have an array and we have a bunch of indices. And if we call uh, take on that array and these indices, what it's gonna do is take the zeroth element of the array, so that's the four, the first element of the array, that's the three, and then the fourth element of the array, which is uh, the six. Uh, so that's how we get uh, four, three, six. And let's try it ourselves a few times. Uh, so let's say that A is uh, an array with uh, some values uh, and let's do a dot take and uh, let's pass in some indices here so let's pass in two two one one uh, four so uh, that's two two uh, should we should get this four four then one one, we should get a five five, and then uh, four, we should get this two. Uh, and that's what we get, four, four, five, five, two. But another useful thing uh, that you can do with take is you can pass indices that are not one dimensional. So here, let's pass a two dimensional uh, indices. And what that's gonna do is return a two dimensional answer. So it's again taking from A, so this two refers to the second element of a, which is that four. This two refers to the second element of a, which is that four. This one refers to the first element of a, which is the five. And uh, this four refers to the fourth element of a, which is the two. So let me show you one more way that you can use take. So let's say that a is uh, scipy zeros uh, five five uh, plus a. So a now has all these columns and let's say that a is uh, a transpose 
So A has all these rows. So the first row is all threes, the second is all fives, all fours, and so forth. One thing that we could do is uh, a.take and pass in some indices like uh, 1, 3, 2, 1. And let's say axis equals 0. So what that's going to do is take the first row, the third row, the second row, and then the first row. So we expect a row of 3s, a row of 4s, uh, sorry, a row of 5s, uh, a row of 3s, uh, a row of fours and then a row of fives. So let's see if that's what actually happens. So fives, threes, fours, and fives. So uh, the answer kind of matches up with our expectation. So this is an incredibly useful function uh, and lets you avoid lots and lots of for loops, both for this assignment and for your next homework assignment. So uh, you might consider using that one. The next topic that we discussed in class uh, was um, your homework assignment, just going over the solutions of the homework. So let's take a look at uh, some of the solutions that I created. Uh, so this was my solution uh, and just uh, some comments from the TA in terms of grading our homework assignment. So uh, he told me a couple of uh, things. So the first thing that he told me was that uh, uh, you should try to make slightly shorter videos for explaining your code. So some of you are much too detailed in explaining your code. And so if you could create uh, shorter videos and be slightly less detailed, but still detailed enough so that he understands what you're doing where and why, uh, that would help him grade your homework assignments better. Uh, the second thing that he mentioned is uh, to generally not do import one module as another module. So many of you do things like import NumPy as NP, uh, but that is generally bad style because one of you might call it NP, one of you might call it NPY and so forth. And so it's difficult to, for the reader to know what module that code is coming from. Uh, so if you have a built-in module like pandas, just import it as pandas. If you have uh, scipy, just import it as scipy. Uh, over here, I'm doing uh, import this module as something because the module has a very long name. And so I want to shorten the name a little bit uh, for the purpose of the code. Uh, so uh, in the homework assignment, one of the things that you were asked to do was create a derived class from an existing class. Uh, so the existing class uh, was called GeoPlotter, and uh, I asked you to create a new class that we're going to call MillexPlotter. So uh, many of you may have taken the GeoPlotter code and cut-pasted it into your file. So in general, that's bad style, uh, because if somebody else goes and creates some fantastic new functionality uh, into the GeoPlotter class, then your class isn't going to benefit from that unless you go and cut paste that code uh, into yours again. However, if you do as I'm doing here and you import GeoPlotter as a module and then you just reference it, then if somebody goes and changes GeoPlotter and adds some great new functionality to it, then uh, MillexPlotter is going to automatically get that new functionality. Uh, so this is much better style than cut pasting the code. So let's read uh, over what uh, some of this code does. So at the beginning here, uh, a millexplotter object gets initialized uh, by calling the geoplotter initialization, drawing the world, reading the shape file, and reading the database that we're going to use for our uh, uh, movie. So one of the things I wanted to do in uh, implementing my code was change the way that draw world works on GeoPlotter. In particular, if you call uh, draw world on GeoPlotter, it draws the world in a particular kind of way with a particular color to the continents and a particular line style to the borders. And uh, I want to draw it here with uh, slightly different defaults. And so I've created a uh, draw world class that changes the color of the continents to blue and changes uh, the uh, coastlines uh, so that they look a little bit nicer for this movie. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that happens when you create an object and you call draw world on it is Python successively looks at the classes that this object comes from 
to find the class that implements that particular function. So if we create a millex pro plotter object and call draw world on it, it's this draw world that's going to get executed as opposed to geo plotters draw world. And oftentimes people refer to that as overriding a previous function. So this draw world overrides the geo plotter uh, draw world function. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the other uh, functions in my solution here. So uh, one is plot year. And uh, within it uh, is some code that you may have not seen before. So uh, the first line here, what it does is it defines a function inside of this existing function. So we define plot country inside of plot year. Um, and so let's uh, read what the plot country uh, function does. Um, Uh, so this country takes in a country code as argument and a bunch of keyword arguments that uh, are going to define how you want to plot that country. So inside of here, there's a for loop that iterates over all the polygons in the shape file and checks if that polygon has that country code. And if it does, then uh, it appends the polygon to this array, to this index array. So at the end of the for loop, we're going to have all the polygons that correspond to a particular country. So then if we do uh, self dot draw shapes uh, on the world uh, and we pass in an index uh, then uh, we can draw that entire country with these particular color codes so uh, here we've collected all the polygons for a country and drawn all of those polygons uh, at the same time uh, using uh, those particular uh, color specifications so let's read the rest of the function. So uh, this clears the image, it draws the world, and it creates a color map. Now this color map is gonna uh, take in values that are between the maximum country index and the minimum country index. And my movie uh, starts from 1914 onwards, and so here I'm finding the maximum index from 1914 onwards in the data set, and the minimum one, which is gonna be zero. So one of the things the homework assignment asked you to do was uh, read about matplotlib normalize uh, and understand a little bit of the documentation there and use it. And so um, uh, he, hopefully you are all able to do that. So let's take a look at the rest of my code here. Uh, so I'm iterating over all unique countries and I'm checking whether this country has a uh, index value for this year. So that's what this next line does. So in this year and for this country, uh, let's pull out all the index values. And uh, it may not have an index value because not all countries have index values in this data set. And so if it doesn't have, uh, if it does have an index value, so that's the first part of this if statement, then we're gonna assign a color code to it based on normalizing the index and then passing it into the color map. Uh, and otherwise, uh, we're gonna give it a blue color. And at the end, uh, we're going to uh, plot uh, that country uh, with that face color. Uh, and at the very end here, the last line, what it does is it uh, puts the year number uh, at the corner of the frame uh, for this movie. So let's read the rest of the code here. It creates a millex plotter object and then iterates over all the years, creating all of the frames uh, for each year and then saving that frame. And so uh, hopefully uh, you find this useful and you find some similarities and differences uh, with the codes that you wrote for solving your homework assignment. And the last thing that uh, we did in class was we tried to implement, uh, and we got reasonably far along with it, uh, a chi-squared test for uh, checking whether our idea for generating uniformly random directions uh, actually does generate uniformly random directions. So. Uh, Let's just remind ourselves what the chi-square test does. And in particular, we're gonna look at Pearson's chi-square test. And you can read this documentation. Uh, but in general, the way that this test works is uh, the following. And in general, all statistical tests work like this. There's some value that uh, people call a statistic, 
that has a known distribution. And we're going to compute the quantity or the value associated with that statistic. And we're going to see if uh, that value falls uh, within a range of that distribution that's reasonable or not. So uh, uh, for the chi-square test, we need the following to compute the uh, statistic. So we need uh, the number of observations in a particular group, so the number of observations of type I, and then the expected number of observations of type I. Uh, so let's see how this relates to us checking whether we have a uniformly random direction. So in general, to check if uh, we have a uniformly random direction, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take the circle and draw, divide it into a number of bins, right? So uh, here we might divide it into 10 bins, we might divide it into 100 bins, and we're hoping that for each little piece of the pie, because they're going to be evenly sized pieces of the pie, uh, for each piece of the pie, we're going to have the same number of points fall in that particular uh, part of the pie. And we're going to test that <clears throat> against, uh, we're going to test the, obser the observed number of points that fall into that piece of the pie uh, versus the expected number of points that fall into that piece of the pie. So in Python, one thing that's going to help us is that there's a function inside of scipy.stats That's uh, the sky square function. And if you read the uh, documentation here, it essentially computes a chi square test. So it takes in two inputs, which is the observed frequency in each uh, little segment. So for us, those little segments are pieces of pi, but in general, there might be all kinds of little segments that you define uh, your, you divide your distribution in. So the observed frequencies and then the expected frequencies for each little uh, category, which for us is a piece of the pie. So uh, here I've written some code to implement uh, the chi-square test in Python. And uh, let's just read over this code uh, to understand what it does. <clears throat> so the first thing that it does is it generates uh, a 1,000 uniformly random directions. So here, Enders is a parameter, and we're going to generate a thousand uh, uniformly random uh, normal uh, uh, standard normal random variables. So it's going to be a thousand by two because I need a thousand vectors. So if you visualize what u looks like at the end of this line, and uh, maybe we can just uh, execute that uh, to see what it looks like. Uh, so this is often how I program uh, or I create my programs is I have a Python file on the side that just opened in my text editor and then I have the Python interpreter that I'm constantly running the code that's inside of my text editor. So here, the way that I do that is run dash i uh, chi squared. Uh, and then if we look at uh, u, you can see that it's uh, a whole bunch of uh, two-dimensional vectors. So each row has a two-dimensional vector in it. And uh, each coordinate of those two-dimensional vectors is a standard normal. So the next part that I need to do to generate a uniformly random direction is uh, normalize these vectors so that they have a norm of one. And so that's what this next line does. Uh, and uh, if we just read it here, we take uh, the product of u times u. Uh, so this uh, does the element-wise uh, product. Then we're summing across ac the first axis, which is summing across uh, the columns. So at the end of this, we're going to have a thousand numbers, so one for each row, because we sum the columns out. So we have one for each row. Uh, we take the square root. And then we reshape that into a thousand by one. So the reason is that we want this division sign to work. And u is a thousand by two versus if we don't do this reshape, uh, this highlighted section uh, is just a thousand. So uh, the SciPy broadcasting rules don't do what we want them to do. And what we want to do 
is divide each row of u by its associated norm. So that's why we have to do this reshape at the end. So uh, let's run that. Uh, and let's take a look at u. And uh, let's import uh, scipy.linalg and then do uh, scipy uh, norm of u uh, across the first axis. And uh, maybe norm doesn't take, uh, so in my particular version of scipy here, norm doesn't take an axis uh, argument. But you can double check and the norm of all these vectors are going to be one. Okay, so the next thing to do is we need to ch uh, figure out each of these vectors, which piece of the pie they fall in. So if we go back to our picture, if we have uh, a vector that's over here in the circle, we need to know that it lands in the second piece of the pie. So the way to do that is we need to know uh, this angle here. So for, from each vector, we need to compute its angle. So uh, one useful function to do that in Python is uh, the arctan2 function. So here I've uh, put in the variable number of bins, how many bins uh, we want to create. Uh, and then let's just read some documentation for arctan2. So, so uh, this does the element-wise arctangent uh, choosing the quadrant correctly. So uh, if you read the return values, it returns uh, values in the range of minus pi to pi. Uh, so if we compare this with just arctan, if we compare this uh, with arctan, uh, arctan just returns values from minus pi over two to pi over two. So the problem with arctan is that it's not going to compute all the angles correctly. So um, arctan uh, only does something that's a range of pi, but we need something that's a range of 2 pi uh, because we want to fi uh, figure out the angles for the whole uh, part of the circle. So in particular, if we're over here, we want to get a different answer than if we're over there, for example. And so that's why uh, we use the arctan2 function uh, to return some angles. Now these angles are going to be between minus pi and pi. And so what I've done in my code here is added pi to that to shift everything over to be between 0 and 2 pi, kind of the same way that we expect angles to be uh, in terms of radians. So uh, now our angles are between uh, 0 and pi. So the next thing we need to do uh, now that we have all of our angles between 0 and pi, and you can imagine it like this, so here is 0 and here is uh, 2 pi, what we need to do is divide this into a bunch of bins. Uh, and the way that we can do that uh, the way that we can do that is The way that uh, we can do that is with the lin space function in scipy. So here I'm saying take the space between 0 and 2 pi and divide it into uh, n bins plus 1. So the reason I uh, put in n bins plus 1 is because uh, what this lin space function does, if we read the documentation, and let's just take a look at that. So, is the, uh, so in particular, if you take a look at endpoint, if true, stop is the last sample. So in other words, uh, and that's uh, by default, uh, endpoint is true. So the last thing that this is going to return is 2 pi. But I actually want uh, n bins in between 0 and 2 pi. So that's why I need to pass in uh, n bins plus 1. Uh, so just to show you that, let's just do it here on the uh, command line. So let's go between 0 uh, and let's say 1, and let's request uh, two bins. So then what I get is 0 and 1. But if I request 3, I get 0 0.5 and 1. So uh, that's why we need to put in n bins plus 1 uh, into uh, lint space. Uh, 
So now uh, bins is dividing the space between 0 and 2 pi into equally spaced uh, uh, segments. Uh, so now what we need to do is figure out how many of the angles fall into each of these segments. So the function that can help you there is uh, histogram 2. So I'm not going to read the documentation for it. Uh, you can read it yourself. Uh, but here we pass in the array that we want to get the counts for uh, and then the bins that we want to count in and it returns the count within each bin. And the reason that I'm uh, dropping the last element here is because the last bin is 2 pi and the, what uh, histogram 2 does is it's going to return a 0 at the end because 0 uh, of our directions are going to land uh, into the space of 2 pi to infinity. Uh, and so that's why this minus 1 gets dropped. And so uh, at the end here, we're uh, going to run the chi-square test. We pass in our observed counts, and we pass in our expected counts. So what are our expected counts? Well, uh, in each little piece of the pi, we expect how many other uh, points we sampled, so that's enders, uh, times 1 over the number of uh, pieces of pi that there is. So that's what's happening here. We're creating an array of all ones, and we're dividing it uh, by the number of bins. So if we have 10 bins, this is going to be an array of uh, 1 tenth, 1 tenth, 1 tenth, 1 tenth, 10 times and we're going to multiply that by a thousand. So that's what we expect to fall in each bin. And at the end, we're going to print the p-value of the statistical test. So in general, if uh, the observed counts actually come uh, from a distribution that has the expected counts, then this p-value is going to be a uniformly random between 0 and 1. Uh, but if we keep getting something that's very small, uh, if we keep getting uh, something that's, uh, let's say, uh, close to 0, then we know that uh, this is not uh, generating uniformly random directions. But if we get something that's uh, uniformly random, then it is. So let's try to run this several times. So we got a p-value that was uh, pretty big. We got a p-value that was pretty big. And so based on these tests, we can be reasonably confident that uh, it's plausible that we're generating uh, uniformly random directions. So let's test it by instead of using random normals, just using rand, which does uniform variables between 0 and 1. So what this did was it changed the code so that we're generating points now uniformly randomly in a box and then normalizing those points so that they have a uh, unit norm. So if you recall, uh, what that should do is it should give us a bunch of bunching around the corners of that box because a lot more probability space is falling into those pieces of pi. And hopefully when we run the chi-square test, uh, we should be getting small p-values. And uh, that's what happens. So here if we run the chi-square test, uh, it consistently rejects the hypothesis that uh, these directions are coming from uniformly random directions. And so it's not the case if we generate a uniformly random point in a square and then we normalize it, we get uniformly random directions. But it is at least plausible, based on this chi-square test, that we're generating uniformly random directions uh, when we do, uh, when we use uh, multivariate normals. Uh, now, of course, uh, there's a proof for that and we sort of discussed that in class, uh, and you can extend that uh, to n dimensions. So thank you very much for listening, and uh, I'll see you all in class next time.